So the first thing you need to understand uh, when you're studying the whole issue of pre-fight rituals is something that we call the passive stance, or you'll also hear it referred to as the fence. Classically, the fence is this position, with your hands raised here, you're still talking, you're still negotiating, and as you're talking to the person, you're maintaining a little bit of distance as you're chatting with your hands out. It's called the fence, the original term the fence, uh, came from the idea of a fence around the factory. It gives you a bit of breathing space and it also gives you a trigger. Because if you don't have set up in your mind just how close you're going to allow that person to come to you before you decide to move into a preemptive strike or preemptive restraint, then when are you going to go? This is one way of doing it. So we'll start with the uh, furthest range um, and then we'll move inward. We'll do it that way. So those are the stances. Now the first thing to understand is there are different types of stances that I'm going to show you. They're pretty much based on the same thing. The most important thing about this stance is that it's actually psychological rather than physical. The physical fence roots you within this concept, but it's actually a psychological concept. The fence is a psychological stance. And the fence is just saying psychologically, okay, I'm going to let you get this close, but no closer than that. And you're actually looking to preempt any movement from the person. Everything we do, we do preemptively. We're always seeking to preempt any action on the part of that person. And you're always seeking to break up that person's sequence of thoughts, what we call the OODA loop. And if you listen to the uh, CDs on NLP and the psychology of violence, I'll go into exactly how you break up people's OODA loop patterns using hypnotic language patterns. The first one that we'll look at, though, is a very, very straightforward pattern interrupt. And this is from the longest range. And this is non-physical. This is almost like a key eye in a way. And you just use your voice. If you want to stop somebody from moving towards you, if you don't like the way they look or they're walking towards you, then the first thing you can do is just tell them to stop. doesn't matter what you say. What matters is how you say it. Uh, when I used to work at the door and I'd work in very, very noisy clubs, people couldn't hear me. I used to try... Just, I would just talk nonsense to people. Now they say 90% of your communication comes through your tone of voice and your body language. And I know for a fact that this is true. Because if I say to somebody, stop, it has exactly the same effect as me saying, bleh. That it's just a noise. This is the noise and the hand gesture. Given the context, within a certain context, will stop them. Similarly that, universally across the world. If you say, stop, or something, some kind of a barking, short, monosyllabic noise, could be anything, could be chair the person will stop because they'll think, what? What are you talking about? And there are times when it's appropriate to use things that create cognitive dissonance, like saying things that are completely random, because it derails the train of thought. So, if I uh, borrow a badge for a second, this is the very, very most basic range. So before this guy even comes into range, say, let's think of a scenario. We've had a, um, a car crash, Rad's likes them. And um, he's dented, I've dented his car. He jumps out of his car, and as he's jumping out of the car and he's walking towards me and I can see he's angry, before I let him get any further, I just go, stop, don't move. Now, if I just say that to him, I say it in the right way, and he carries on moving forward, then we're moving into other ranges and other things. What you're trying to do is keep that person out of range before it's even become physical. Um, my father's father, who was in the army, who's on the camera now, didn't you say that your dad did that once when somebody was walking towards him? At night, yeah. At night, you were yeah. with him. What Some, happened? Well, somebody just asking him uh, for a light. Yeah. He was in the dark. He was on the other side of the road. He right. started to walk across the road towards us. Yeah. And he just went, Dad, still! And just used that army yeah. voice and just said, yeah. and did, did, did the guy stop? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you don't know. You know, it's a dark street. You know, you're walking along with your child. Maybe you feel a little bit like, based on the scenario, it could be something not right. You don't like the look of the guy. You don't have to just let people walk over to you and start talking to you if you don't want that to happen. You have to have solid boundaries. Very, very solid boundaries. If somebody's walking up to you and you're not completely happy about it, then that's fine. Just say, stand still. It doesn't even have to be as aggressive. It's like a dog barking and it can get that effect. Especially if, if he is predatorial as a criminal and he's looking to mug me or something else, he's looking at me and he's making assumptions based on the way I'm dressed because you communicate not just through language, through body language, through haircuts, through, you know, the clothing, the way you're standing, the way you're talking. And he's looking at me and he might be thinking, soft target. I'm now assuming this guy's a little bit of a soft target. And as he's walking over with no facial expression change whatsoever, I'm going around business, I just stop there! It's going to make him go, whoa, what's just happened? It also causes a dump of adrenaline, which we you know starts to shut the person down. 
Now he's confused. That could be the end of that possibly violent confrontation. I just ended it right then. The guy's jumped out of the car, he's pissed off because of the thing car, and I say, stand there! And he'd be like, whoa, hang on. Okay, he was going to try and bully me, and now he's thinking something else is going to happen. I've actually had this happen in real life. I accidentally reversed in somebody's car. The guy jumped out of the car, furious. I was in a really, really good mood, and I just jumped out of the car, and I just stepped towards him and smiled and said, you know, I'm sorry. And he just went... He literally, you could see in his eyes, you know, his eyes defocused, he went into what we call a trans-derivational search, or a trance, and he thought about it, recalculated the situation, looked at me, thought about what he was going to do, and going to say, and then went, you know what, I'm not going to bother. And he went, actually there's no damage done, mate, got in his car, we drove away. This is how you want to end physical confrontations, the art of fighting without fighting. So, now we get to the more physical range. As we get a little bit closer, this is the furthest range sort of stance or fence that I want you to use. This is the one that you'll see police using. And it's a very, very obvious um, fence kind of range. Now, I keep saying, I don't want you to put all your cards on the table. I don't want you to let people know that you're a fighter or that you've got any kind of martial arts experience. I want you to be a nasty surprise. This takes the element of surprise away a little bit because it does start to look like something. But if you decide that it's right for the situation, you really don't want that person coming any further than that, or you're new, you're a beginner, this is a great one to start with. And you say, whoa, whoa, just stay, just stay there, mate, just stay there. And what you're doing is, if you have to touch, you touch on the center line. Now, here's a good tester. People are going to test you, especially, again, if you're a civilian and you're looking at a predatory criminal who's going to mug you or whatever, or possibly rape you or whatever else then they'll be testing you, they'll be seeing how much of a hard target you are. Similarly, if you're a professional, if you're a doorman, a policeman, or a soldier on peacekeeping duties, people will come and they'll test you because they'll want to know exactly where your boundaries are. This is a nice way of testing the criminal, turning around on them. Because if he steps over to me and he goes, whoa, just wait there, mate. Right, he's looked at me and he's thought, you know what, this guy doesn't really look that strong, he doesn't really look like that much. And then all of a sudden he gets something hard into his chest. I had this recently at a seminar, a little tiny, weak looking fella came over to me and he went, stay back, we were doing this as an exercise. And I went, oh, now if, I, if that had been for real, I would have thought for a second, wow, he just hit me a lot harder than I expected. Let me think about this. Let me have another little reassessment of the situation. And as that person is dealing with that confusion and trying to reassess where they're going on, that's when you go to work. Either physically or with a restraint, or psychologically. You start to talk about something else, or you start to move away from that scenario. It's down to you. It's whatever is appropriate in the scenario for you. Okay, so from here, you can either hit the test just to, to, into, the, into the chest to test them. If they keep coming on and keep coming on, then it's probably going to go physical. The next thing that's probably going to happen from here, I've hit him once and he walks on again and now he's pissed off. The next thing he's going to do is going to swap that out of the way. As soon as that gets swatted, you now need to go physical and make the choice. If he swats that, it's either going to be something like bang and then coming up with something else that's very strong and very aggressive, or it's going to be some kind of a restraint and hold and take down or take them out of the club, whatever it, whatever it is. So you're testing them, they are then retesting you. I've seen a few times recently people uh, working drills like this where they let the person come onto them and they go, whoa, I don't want any trouble, I don't want any trouble, look, I'm really sorry, let me buy you a drink, I don't want any trouble, I don't want any trouble, and they just keep going and keep going and keep going. Don't do that, this is a very, very short drill. If he touches that tentacle twice, this is my tentacle, my sensory tentacle, if he touches it more than twice, I'm weakening in this scenario, I'm now backpedaling, just going on for too long. Certainly, if he tries to move that, if he hits it, I've got to go. No choice. Too late. The fight's on. It's become physical. If I let him swat that out of the way, and I don't go, I'm going into denial. You're denying the reality of the situation. It's time to go. You will have to move forward at that point. Okay. From a slightly closer range, some other physical movements you might use. If he comes a little bit closer, then we could go from here. Basically, at this point, what am I doing? Using the fence, I'm trying to lure him into a false sense of security, and I'm setting him up. I'm setting him up for a sucker punch, or what we call a preemptive strike. If you want to study preemptive strikes, well, really, you should be watching this DVD in combination with the DVD called Preemptive Strikes. Excuse me. And from here, I'll be setting him up for a preemptive burp, and the smell of my burp will knock him out and make his eyes water. 